the topic I'm going to discuss today is a very important concept and gives you an idea as to what goes wrong in the brain during an epileptic seizure. So please stay tuned. It's a very important topic and you will really learn a very important concept. So what do you see here? This EEG shows a very nice sharp wave also called an epileptiform discharge. So let me just draw on top of it so that you can follow me. So let's see here. So this here, this is a sharp wave. And I want you to carefully look at the shape and morphology of this discharge and you'll find why in the next few slides. So look at the shape of all these sharp waves. So you look at these sharp waves. This is the same field. It is extending into the temporal and subtemporal head regions. So look at the sharp wave and look carefully at the morphology of these uh, of this sharp wave. Now imagine that you have a means of recording the potential inside one of these neurons. So this is something that is called the patch clamp. So you are recording potential within the neuron. So if you had an epileptic spike and simultaneously you were recording from inside the neuron, what do you expect to see? Do you know the cellular counterpart of an epileptic spike? So this is basically what I'm trying to emphasize here, that if you have an epileptic spike and you record the potential inside the neuron at the same time, or many neurons at the same time as the epileptic spike, what are you going to find? And basically, this answer is that the cellular counterpart of an epileptic spike is something called paroxysmal depolarization shift. In the coming slides, I will give you a very brief introduction about the PDS. This is also called PDS in short. This is a frequently asked question in many EEG neurophysiology and neurology exam. Now, what you see here, this is neurons on a microscopic level an excellent picture of a typical neuron. If we insert a probe inside the neuron, as we just discussed, there are changing potentials. So you have, we've discussed that, we've discussed about excitatory postsynaptic potentials. We've discussed about inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. And you recall from the last lecture that excitatory postsynaptic potentials move the voltage of the neuron towards the threshold potential. So in this slide here, you can see that the resting membrane potential is minus 70. So this is minus 70 millivolts. When there is an excitatory postsynaptic potential, as shown here in green, the resting membrane potential moves towards the threshold potential, minus 55. The threshold potential is called a threshold potential because when the voltage inside the neuron reaches this point, there is an action potential. So you see this action potential right here. This is an action potential. Only when the voltage reaches minus 55, that's where you get the action potential. Otherwise, you can get excitation because of excitatory postsynaptic potentials or inhibition because of inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. But eventually, when the EPSPs, also called excitatory postsynaptic potentials, reach the threshold of minus 55 millivolts, you have an action potential. So let's move on to the next slide here. And you can see this is a typical action potential in a normal neuron. You have depolarization, you have repolarization, you have hyperpolarization and then you return back to the resting state. Now what is different in an epileptic neuron and that is the big question. So normally, so let me draw again the normal neuron, you have you reach the threshold, you have an action potential, a single action potential, depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization and back to the resting membrane potential. But an epileptic neuron is somewhat different. So let's talk about the epileptic neuron. 
So in, in the epileptic neuron, when the voltage reaches the threshold potential, instead of a single action potential, there is a burst of action potentials, hundreds of bursts of action potential. Then goes into a hyperpolarization state and back to the resting membrane potential right there. So this is called a paroxysmal depolarization shift. And let me draw some of the players that lead to the depolarization and repolarization in this case. Now this is not drawn to scale, it's just to give you an idea. And everything is not precise, so I strongly recommend you refer to any textbook such as Candle and Schwartz or any other textbook of neurology or neurophysiology that gives these basic mechanisms. So this figure is just to give you an idea. This is not perfect. So this here, this here thing here, is called the paroxysmal depolarization shift, also called PDS. The paroxysmal depolarization shift starts by activation of the AMPA receptors. When the AMPA receptors are activated, there is an influx of sodium inside the neurons. And this activates the NMDA receptors. So you have the NMDA receptors that get activated. Activation of the NMDA receptors leads to influx or entry of sodium ions and calcium ions inside the neuron. This leads to the initial sustained depolarization. This opens up fast sodium channels, so sodium channels. And these sodium channels, when these get activated, and because of the rapid rush of sodium inside the cell, this leads to the action potentials, the hundreds of action potentials that you see. So this is the depolarization phase of the paroxysmal depolarization shift. The potassium channel, when these open up, this starts causing the repolarization. Another contributor in the repolarization is the GABA-A receptor. When the GABA-A receptor gets activated, this leads to entry of the chloride ions inside the cell. Chloride is a negative ion and its entry leads to repolarization. So the efflux of potassium and the entry of chloride inside the neuron leads to the hyperpolarization period that you see uh, at the end of the paroxysmal depolarization shift. A single, paroxysmal, a single paroxysmal depolarization shift would not lead to an epileptic spike. So there are two things that are extremely essential to see an epileptic spike. Hyperexcitability which manifests in the form of a paroxysmal depolarization shift and hypersynchronous discharge, meaning hundreds and thousands of these paroxysmal depolarization shifts have to occur at the same time to be able to produce that epileptic spike that you see. And these epileptic spikes end up with a period of negativity. As you see here, there is a period of hyperpolarization. Now, if for some reason or if because of some genetic abnormality or for because of some trauma, if there is no inhibition or hyperpolarization at the end of the PDS, this can lead into an epileptic seizure. So the potassium and the chloride, basically the efflux of potassium and the entry of chloride it works like a brake system for the paroxysmal depolarization shift. If you do not have a braking system, then the car will continue to accelerate. And so uh, that analogy basically describes why paroxysmal depolarization shifts, why epileptic spikes sometimes can lead into an epileptic seizure. This is a very simplified explanation. You can read text for more details and more about different theories that how an epileptic spike 
leads to an epileptic seizure, although the science behind it is not perfectly understood, but there are different theories that you will have a better idea if you understand paroxysmal depolarization shift. So I hope this was helpful and I will end it over here and I wish you success in your careers. Thank you so much.